In this video, we'll take a look at soil conservation. And when soil goes bad, we call it desertification. And this can happen when we have erosion or soil compaction from being pushed down, forest removal, overgrazing, drought, salinization, climate change, depletion of water resources, etc. Which of the following do you think is the biggest cause of soil erosion worldwide? A. Water. B. Wind. C. Industrial pollution. The answer is A. Water. But there are some ways that we can help reduce that. And that's contour farming, intercropping, terracing, and conservation tillage. So contour farming is where you're planting along contour lines of slopes to reduce erosion on hillsides. Water will flow downhill, but when you put these rows of crops perpendicular to the slope, it slows down how fast the water can flow. Water can more easily flow along the grooves of the, um, of the rows of plants than against them. So it's just a matter of slowing down the water. That's the key. Terracing is an extreme example of this. Every one of these little steps is level, or you might say flat. So when the water hits it, the water tends to stay there instead of running off. Pretty labor intensive. Intercropping um, is another idea where you have a variety of crops. And um, this can also help reduce the rate of water flowing along the, um, along the crops along the rows, but the big benefit of this is that you have greater biodiversity. And that means you can have a greater um, diversity of insects, and many of those insects will be predators on other insects. So this is an example of supporting biocontrol, using pests to get rid of your pests. And cover crops. Um, this is also a way of reducing not only water, but also wind erosion. And we know Fairview Gardens does this. So rather than just leaving the soil exposed to sunlight and wind by putting a cover crop, it helps to keep the sun off the soil, which helps reduce it from drying out, and also helps the wind from picking up soil particles and causing wind erosion. And shelter belts, this is another way of reducing wind erosion. You can see these tall trees that are grown around the fields, and they're just there to block the wind. We also have a technique called conservation tillage, which means you're leaving the old crop residue on the ground instead of plowing it into the soil. This covers the soil, keeping it in place. And so, example, no-till and reduced tillage farming, those are um, both examples of conservation tillage. Conservation just means you're trying to save the soil uh, from being eroded. And no-till means you're not doing any turning over of the soil. Turning over is called tilling. And it's a really, um, tilling can be a very useful way of getting rid of weeds. However, you disrupt the natural structure of the soil. You take um, roots, which some of the fungi are feeding on, and you uproot those roots and expose them to the air, and then the fungi will likely die because it might be too dry as they're exposed. Um, reduced tillage just means you're not tilling as much. So typically you will end up getting more weeds this way because you're not turning them over and killing them. So you often will end up having to use more herbicides. So that's one downside. And uh, that's all explained here. Now, when in extreme cases, we can have things like the Dust Bowl, which happened in the 1930s. And that was a major deal where they were doing heavy tillage, tilling of the land using tractors. You know, this is the early 1900s, so we're really starting to ramp up our use of combustion engines. And this happened to coincide with a period of drought in the US. So now you had all this farmland, which had been tilled over, it's lost its structure, and along comes the wind and just blew it away. And you can see just how much erosion has occurred. Um, all this sediment that you see here was taken from farm fields you know, elsewhere, carried by the wind. And they say that the, this you know, dirt from, I forget the statistics, but the dirt could go over several states before landing. So like soil from uh, Indiana could end up in New York State. So this prompted the Soil Conservation Act of 1935, which provided money to educate farmers how to plow their lands without damaging them, and also helped to promote the planting of trees and native grasses to reduce erosion. And it also helped pay farmers to not, till their, to not grow as many crops to try to give the soil a chance to recover. One way that you can improve crop um, soil fertility is by doing crop rotation. And we also saw examples of this at Fairview, or we will see examples of it. 
all you're doing is alternating the crop being planted. So, for example, corn one season, soybeans the next. This can restore the nutrients to the soil and also fight pests and disease. It makes a lot of sense because uh, soybeans, as we know, are legumes. So they have those rhizobium bacteria on the roots, and those bacteria do nitrogen fixation. So that helps restore nitrogen levels. But also, think about pests. So if you have a pest that likes to um, live among corn plants, well, the next season, when you have soybeans instead, those, those pests are all going to leave. Leave, So it'll help reduce their population size. We can also do intercropping, like we talked about before. And ultimately, what we're going for here is to help to maintain appropriate levels of soil nutrients so that we um, don't have any one nutrient acting as a major limiting nutrient. Okay, so which of the following do you think is the biggest cause of soil degradation worldwide? A, deforestation, B, industrial pollution, C, damaging farming methods, or D, overgrazing? Let's take a look at the graph. So it is D, overgrazing, but cropland agriculture and deforestation are about equal. So overgrazing, I'm going to ask you a question then. Uh, which one of these two sides do you think is the one being overgrazed? And all that's separating them is this little fence. So I think the answer is on the bottom here. It is indeed. The left is ungrazed. The right is overgrazed. You see these grasses on the left side? And on the right side, most of them have been um, eaten away, and that leaves more space for invasive weeds to come in. So here's a question. If you analyze this flowchart, would you say that overgrazing is an example of positive or negative feedback loop, ultimately leading to desertification? So if you said that it's a negative feedback loop, you're wrong. Negative feedback loops create stability, and desertification is something that snowballs. Um, in other words, the worse the soil gets, the more quickly it gets worse. And so this is positive feedback loop. And some examples of this is um, if you remove the native grass, then that's going to expose bare topsoil. That's going to make it more susceptible to wind and water erosion, which is going to remove more native grass, etc. Or on this pathway, you might be compacting the soil, which damages the soil structure which makes it harder for the water to infiltrate because it's all kind of packed hard, also decreases the ability for oxygen to go in, which we call aeration. And ultimately, this will decrease the grass's growth and ability to survive. Also mentioned here, invasive species can gain a foothold and outcompete natives in the altered environment. So good responsible grazing can be done, and it often involves doing prescribed burns. We know that um, the natives of California here, the Chumash, would do prescribed burns, not because they were doing um, uh, grazing of animals, but they were cultivating local native crops. And they knew that every once in a while, what they would do prescribed burns, it would help to clear out um, maybe plants that they didn't want, weeds, but also help improve the fertility of the soil by returning nutrients. One big thing with um, deforestation is that it's also a practice that can cause erosion. Here we see a hillside which has been clear cut. So when it rains, the water can flow very fast because there are no tree trunks to slow it down. So it's bringing with it sediment. And it's basically washing away that top soil layer, which is where the nutrients are. And if you get rid of too much of the top soil, you're getting down into more of the parent rock, which does not support life. And there are some smarter ways to do this. We can do what's called selective cutting, which leaves some mature trees for reseeding the area and slowing water flow. We'll learn a bit more about that in the coming unit. All right, we'll stop there. Thanks for tuning in.